want to thank all of our visitors for being here with us today. If this, the, uh, if this is the first time that you've been with us at Monta Vista, then we uh, encourage you to fill out a visitor's card. It's in a small rack in the pew in front of you. There will be a time at the end of our service today where you'll be able to place that visitor's card in a basket. We would just like to thank you for your attendance and offer you any spiritual assistance if you have any. If you'd like to sit down and study with us, then we would really like to show you what is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is simply the good news that salvation is offered to you freely. Please have your Bibles open to Psalm 38, verses 1 through 8. Psalm 38, verses 1 through 8. I had an interesting article this week that I read. As most of you are probably aware, if you've been keeping up with the news, recently... The Ashley Madison website, which is a website that connects people who want to have adultery with each other, was hacked and about 30 million accounts were leaked. Email addresses and financial records and that sort of thing. Among those who were leaked as having participated in the Ashley Madison Affair website was a pastor. And that really stuck out to me because we're in a similar line of work. I don't know everything about this man's theological or doctrinal beliefs, so I did not sit in judgment of him in that regard. But when it was discovered that he had an account, he couldn't bear the reproach and the guilt. He left a note, and he killed himself. And his family, of course, was completely shaken by that. The congregation that he worked with also was shaken by that. One thing that his wife said that really stuck out to me was he was a man who preached grace and forgiveness to everybody around him, but he couldn't find grace and forgiveness for himself. Sometimes our sins are so heavy upon us that we feel like we simply cannot bear them anymore. And instead of accepting the grace that comes freely from Jesus Christ, which is forgiveness for all of our sins and the promise of eternal salvation with Him, we believe that we can take the easy road out, the exit. We can push the escape button and get away from confronting the challenges before us. Now this is not going to be a lesson on suicide because I think there are a lot of other considerations when it comes to that subject. We don't have time to get into that too much, and this is also not going to be a lesson on this particular man's doctrinal or theological beliefs. But I did feel like that that was a very, very timely way to introduce a timeless psalm. So let's read here in Psalm 38, verses 1 through 8, and see the way that sin weighs upon us both spiritually as well as physically sometimes. And go ahead and place a bookmarker in Psalm 38 as we are going to be spending our time in our lesson in that passage. Verses 1 through 8 says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, and chasten me not in thy burning anger. For thine arrows have sunk deep into me, and thy hand has pressed down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin." For my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. My wounds grow foul and fester. Because of my folly, I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long. For my loins are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am benumbed and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. In one commentary, the writer introduced this psalm with the words, Of all the penitential psalms, that is, psalms of apology, penitence, repentance, of all the penitential psalms, this is the one which shows the deepest marks of utter prostration of heart and spirit under a combination of the severest trials, both mental and bodily. His body, he says, is smitten with disease, the flesh without soundness, the bones full of aches, the loins agonized with a sense of burning, the heart palpitating, the strength and sight failing. And through all, there is the feeling that the whole is the result 
of his own sin. Most of us would agree with the psalmist that sin leaves us feeling sick. Now maybe it might not be a, a physical sickness, something that is identifiable medically, but you know how it is when you're anxious about something, when you're guilty about something. Now, I don't know if the writer of this psalm was being literal when he talks about no soundness in his flesh, and no health in his bones, his wounds grow foul and fester. I don't know if he's being literal there. That because of his sin, he actually faced a physical dilemma of some kind. And I've never had to face that. But I do know that I sure feel like that when I commit sin. That my body might as well become foul and grow fester because of the sin that I hold in. When I don't confess my sin. When I'm not honest about my sin. When I'm not willing to face my sin and deal with it. You know what happens when a wound grows foul? When you're not willing to confront the problem. When you, when you will not get the right kind of medicine. When you will not bandage it properly when you're not willing to confront it and its ugliness, the wound grows worse and worse and worse and it takes over one part of your body after another. And sin is the same way, my friends. The thing about sin is that it affects every part of your life eventually. We always think that sin is one of those things that we can keep in a nice, tidy little box and that we can kind of keep it separate from everything else. And maybe all those 30 million guys on AshleyMadison.com Maybe they thought they could keep their sin in a nice, tidy box. As long as they keep my records confidential, as long as the information doesn't get leaked, maybe if I just pay the fee and have them delete my account altogether, it will just vanish. And I can keep that little sin in a nice, tidy box. One person described sin really, really well. One person said, sin, sin is like trying to carry water in the front of your shirt. It always leaks out. It penetrates. It dribbles over the sides. It soaks. It saturates. It leaks everywhere. You cannot keep sin separate. You might have a sin in one part of your life, and it will seep into every other part of your life, and it will destroy you. And that's what the writer of Psalm 38 is feeling right now. I am being destroyed physically because of my sin. He says of God that thine arrows have sunk deep into me and thy hand has pressed down on me. And at times it is very true that the piercing judgment of God leaves us feeling these things. But aren't we so grateful in the long run that God shot that arrow at all? Maybe if God had not shot the arrow, maybe if we had not been pierced by that, we might have never felt what was needed to change. Yes, thine arrows have sunk deep into me and thy hand has pressed down on me, but maybe that's what I needed to get out of this sin. Let's be grateful for all the times that we got caught. And we're all thinking back because you remember those times well. You remember those times when you were young and your parents caught you. You remember those times when your spouse caught you, when you lied and it became obvious the truth always comes out it's funny thing about sin isn't it your sins will find you out you can't keep those things hidden think of all the times that you got caught and be thankful for them because maybe that was what you needed to finally get out of sin to finally realize just how severe the sin was and to know what you needed to get out of it now the psalmist talks about how sin has become a heavy burden how his sins weigh too much for him. And he is absolutely right about that. Whether we believe we sin very little or if we sin a lot, all sins overcome the human soul and overburden it at some point. Go back to Psalm 40. Or go forward to Psalm 40 and notice Psalm 40 verse 12. Evils beyond number have surrounded me, he says. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. Who wrote Psalm 40? At least according to the editor, human tradition. 
David. You know, wrote Psalm 38? David. And yet we always have this impression of David as being a man after God's own heart, that he was a friend of God, that he was somebody who served God very faithfully, and he did. Yes, he did. And maybe he didn't have a lot of sins numerically, but did David feel like he had a lot of sins? I think that's the attitude that we have to have when we come to the throne of grace. When we come to the throne of grace, we don't come to God saying, well, you know, i got a couple of things I need to address with you, God. Let, let's, just, let's just get one or two of the big things off my chest while I'm here. No. Whether you've sinned a little or a lot, it doesn't matter. One sin or a thousand is going to condemn you in the eyes of God. We've all sinned and fallen short of His glory, according to Romans 3 and verse 23. So there's not a single one of us that can go to the throne of grace and say, it's just a couple things, God. I got everything mostly right, but I just got a couple things that we need to deal with. No, when I approach the throne of grace, I'm going to stick my face to the dirt and say, I can't even count the, numbers on my, the, the number of hairs on my head, and God, that is my sin. My sin has overwhelmed me. It is abundant. It is beyond what I can handle. God, I need you. I like this term, I am benumbed and badly crushed. Interesting Hebrew word there. The word benumbed there is the word pug in Hebrew, and it means stunned or to become cold. Almost like the idea of your fingers or your toenails or your extremities losing feeling in the cold. You're jumping into icy water or something like that. And you can feel your toes begin to go numb and they start to tingle and you can feel them getting colder. That's what that word benumbed means. I am benumbed. Sometimes our sins are so heavy upon us that all we can do is just go, God, what are you going to do? Sometimes we're so speechless about our sins. You ever been caught in a sin, caught in a lie, and you just you have nothing else to say anymore? And all you can do is just go, I got nothing. No defense. No response. I'm benumbed, he says. I'm benumbed and badly crushed. My sins have overcome me so much, I don't even know what to feel anymore about them. What a state we find ourselves in, friends. What a state we find ourselves in. What a mess we make of our lives. Physically as well. Let's not forget something here. I know that while we're talking about Psalm 38, we might be very tempted to look at these verses and talk, think of them as, as purely metaphorical or purely symbols. Or He's not being literal here. And yet, is it also true that sin can have a physical crush Sin can have a physical blow. Sin can have a physical weight upon us. Yeah. You remember what it says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 27. In Romans 1 verse 27, he is not being metaphorical or symbolic when he says that in their persons, they pay the penalty for their sin. Some sins do come with a physical consequence that actually harms your physical person. Sin is costly. It is very expensive, physically and spiritually. Let's read verses 9 through 12 now. Psalm 38, verses 9 through 12. Lord, he says, all my desire is before thee, and my sighing is not hidden from thee. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, even that has gone from me. My loved ones, my friends, they stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Those who seek my life lay snares for me, and those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction, and they devise treachery all day long. I do like in verse 9 that there's a glimmer of hope in dealing with his sin. The very fact that the writer has come to a point where he is even talking to God, where he is even embracing God, that my desire is before thee that I at least want you, God, that's a good sign. That's a very good sign. Some of us have to reach that point before we ever change, right? We, we have to hit rock bottom. We, don't, we shouldn't have to, but some of us have to hit rock bottom before we realize just how much we need God. 
I think we need to be very, very careful in our evangelism. That as we're knocking on doors and turning rocks over and digging into people's lives, we need to be very, very careful in our evangelism that when we find somebody who has a very messed up life, it is a tangled mess of bad relationships and bad choices, we need to be careful not to go, ooh, <laughs> that's a little above my pay grade. <laughs> Here's a radio program card. I gotta get out of here. Those are the very people who are probably most eager for God at all. They're the people who are most willing to sit down and listen. Some people have to reach that point before they can ever get back up. And I think it's a great sign here that, Lord, my desire is before thee. My sighing is not hidden from me. At the very least, I'm open to you. I'm talking to you, and I want you. Even the light of my eyes, even the light of my eyes has failed. Even when we put on a good show and act impenetrable, sin has a way of stifling the vibrancy of life. Don't fall for the lie that sin completes you or gives you some kind of added zest for life or an added dimension of fun or romance. No. Sin doesn't make life more fun. It makes life less fun. It takes the glimmer from your eye. That twinkle in your eye. The smile. Optimism. Sin takes all of that from us. It kills all of us. My loved ones and my friends, they stand aloof from my plague. Sin also alienates you. Sin isolates you. You know, the thing about the promise of sin is, I'm going to give you a whole new set of friends. You know all those boring Christian friends that you had? Your boring parents, your siblings, that, that dusty old preacher. All those boring Christian associations, you give those up. And I promise you, when you live this kind of lifestyle, I'm going to get you a whole new set of friends. But they're all just as miserable because of their sins. Misery just breeds misery. You know what sin does? It doesn't give you new friends. It doesn't give you added vigor or zest for life. It takes it from you. It takes the friends that actually mean something. The drinking buddies, they're not going to be there for you when your marriage falls apart. A spouse that you only married because of money or because of sex, that's not a marriage that's going to work in the long run. Sin takes and takes and takes and doesn't give you anything but grief. In another sense, though, the trials that we endure are very insulating and very alienating. Satan wants us to feel alone in our distress. He wants us to feel disconnected from people who might otherwise influence us for our good. He wants us to believe that our sins are special and that nobody else can possibly understand them. Now, it was said in the article that I read that this pastor also suffered from depression on and off again. And that might be the case. And if that is the case, there's a way that he could have gotten help. You don't have to be alone as you suffer through depression. You don't have to be alone. But whether a person is clinically depressed or not is immaterial to the fact that there is always somebody out there who cares about you. Who cares about you enough that they would go the whole distance to save you. To snatch you out of sin. To pull you back. Never believe for a second the lie that there's someone out there who wouldn't understand you. And I think it is a real shame that that man got caught in his sin and felt like the only way out was to kill himself. That maybe nobody could have understood. Nobody would have forgiven. Nobody would have put themselves in his shoes or nobody had actually been in his shoes. Let me level with you guys. I don't know if any one of you had an adultery account on AshleyMadison.com. I certainly hope not. But there were over 30 million people who had an account. 30 million! If you're struggling with pornography, 
If you've had an affair, if you have an addiction that you're keeping secret, let me level with you. You are not nearly as alone as you think you are. And if you were just honest about your sin, you just might find another Christian in this room right here who went through the same thing you did and beat it. I think the biggest problem that we have, my friends, in our culture is that we are not honest with each other. We don't share with each other. We like to put on the show and look right and look nice and we don't want to expose ourselves. We don't want to run the risk of embarrassment. But I have a feeling if we actually had to wear our sins on our sleeves, if we all knew each other the way that God knows us, we'd all have something to be embarrassed about. Maybe there's something we did just this morning that we're embarrassed about. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And when we start to really understand that passage in Romans 3.23, and when we really read things like Psalm 38 and get into deep into these passages, we realize just how close we can be to other people as we strive and struggle and overcome the things that try to keep us from heaven. Verses 13 through 22. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. And I am like a dumb man who does not open his mouth. Yes, I am like one who does not hear and whose mouth are no arguments. For I hope in thee, O Lord, thou wilt answer. O Lord, my God. For I said, may they not rejoice over me who, when my foot slips, would magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to fall and my sorrow is continually before me. I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. My enemies are vigorous and strong, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. And those who repay evil for good, they oppose me, because I follow what is good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. The psalmist's description of himself as both deaf and dumb is a perplexing analogy to me. Perhaps he means that he just has no answer for himself in his conduct, and I can certainly see that. That's a good point. That when you are caught in your sin, what can you do? You can lie a little bit more and just make things worse, or you can just be honest about it. And I think what he's saying is, I have no defense. God, everything is open and laid bare to you. You know what I've done. Other people know what I've done. It's public information now. What can I say? How can I defend myself? I'm, I'm deaf and dumb. And while this is a good point, and it's very true for most of us, the next statement adds another dimension. For I hope in thee, O Lord, for thou wilt answer. Like someone who's incapable of hearing and speaking, the writer of Psalm 38 depends on God for his answer. You Christians are just as sinful as the rest of us. Josh Duggar had an Ashley Madison account. Hmm? See? Those Duck Dynasty guys are always getting into trouble. See? Christians are just as bad as all the rest of us. And you know what? Like Psalm 38 says, I'm deaf and dumb. You're right. I do commit sin. I'm not perfect. My marriage is not perfect. My parenting is not perfect. I don't always look at the right things. I don't always say the right things. I don't always act like how I'm supposed to act. You're right. Christians do commit sin. But like Psalm 38 says, Thou wilt answer, O my God. I'm deaf and dumb. I have no excuse. But you'll come to my defense. Because your son died for me. And because I believe in Him, and because I believe in matchless, limitless grace, it is God who will justify me, and it is God who will answer for me. And on the last day, when those are parted, the sheep on the right and the goats on the left, it is God who will come to my defense. For I confess my iniquity, 
What a healthy way to answer. I'm not going to hold it in. I'm not going to hide it anymore. I'm not going to try to keep it secret. I confess my iniquity because I'm full of anxiety. My sin is killing me. I can't hold this in anymore. I have to confess. What else can I do with it? There's a degree to which we should have anxiety about sin, yes. And I think the degree to which we should have anxiety about sin is when it motivates us to change. I should feel bad about my sin. I should feel anxious about it. And that should lead me to change. Earlier in our worship service, we read from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. I love that passage. That's one of my favorite passages in the whole New Testament. But Paul talks about how I caused you sorrow by my letter. And I regretted it at first, but I don't regret it now. Because I realize that you have a sorrow that is a godly sorrow. It is a godly sorrow that led you to repentance, which leads to eternal life. And that is a repentance that has no regret. That's my favorite phrase in that. A repentance with no regret. That's the sorrow of God. When you're anxious about your sin and it motivates you to change, you don't have to regret that. But the sorrow of the world, the sorrow of the world, and it's hard to talk about it. Because a man killed himself because he committed a, adultery. The sorrow of the world produced death in that man. He felt bad about his sin. Yes, he did. He felt bad that he got caught. He felt bad that he betrayed his wife. He felt bad that he disappointed a congregation that he was supposed to be Leading in some fashion. His sorrow didn't produce repentance, though. His sorrow produced death. Very tangibly. Very real death in his life. When we finally embrace the idea that we cannot save ourselves and it is God's mercy alone that brings us back from the precipice, then we can get back to the divine work that is set before us. And we can be God's people. And we can be pure. And we can be white. We can be clean and we can be saints. Even though God's people are often outnumbered in this world, they are always on the winning side. The psalmist concludes his psalm by talking about how his enemies are so vigorous and strong, but even his vigorous and strong enemies are destined for defeat because they cannot match up with the God of salvation. Now maybe you're not a Christian here this morning. You need to be. You need to be. Because a psalm like Psalm 38 is never going to mean anything to you unless you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can be saved through Jesus Christ is to believe that He is the Son of God. To be willing to confess that belief before others. To repent of the sins that you've been carrying with you your whole life. To be baptized for the remission of those sins and to give your life over to God forever. To say that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Stop feeling bad about sin and start feeling good about grace. Whatever need you might have, please come forward as we stand and sing.